one. Oh, it's time. Like Yahweh, there is no one who is like Yahweh. He is strong and mighty. Who is like Yahweh? He is worthy. So stand up and give him the praise. Who is like Yahweh? There is no one who is like Yahweh. He is strong and mighty. Who is like Yahweh? He is worthy. So stand up and give Him the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our Yah is, Our Yah is worthy of glory. From the rising of the sun to its going down. The name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like Yahweh? There is no one who is like Yahweh. He is strong and mighty. Who is like Yahweh? He is worthy. So stand up and give Him the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise our God is worthy of glory From the rising of the sun To the is going down The name of the Lord is to be praised Stand up and praise Him And give Him the glory Stand up and praise Him And give Him the glory Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Stand up and praise Him and give Him the glory. Our God is worthy to be praised. Stand up and give Him the praise. Stand up and give Him the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our God is worthy of glory. From the rising of the sun, through its going down, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Who is like the way? There is no one who is like Yahweh. He is strong and mighty. Who is like Yahweh? He is worthy. So stand up and give him the praise. Come on, man. stand up and give him the praise. Come on, man. Stand up 
and give him the praise, praise the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> the spirit of the sovereign God is on me. The spirit of the sovereign Yah is upon me. Because Yahweh has anointed me to proclaim the full message to the humble. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart. To proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness for the prisoner. To proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor and the day of vengeance of our Elohim. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve and see on. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of action. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Then they will be called the oaks of righteousness, a planting of Yahweh for the display of His splendor. Again, with this dry and thirsty land, 
with me beautiful ashes, the oil of joy for me, and a garment of praise, with spirit of heaviness, and a garment of praise, with spirit of heaviness. I will rejoice in you.
in Yahweh. My soul shall be joyful in my Elohim, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the sovereign Yahweh will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Amen.
get your sedours out. Ah, me. It's good to see everybody this Sabbath morning. We still got several outside sick, and so I ask you to remember them. Lindsay is battling with this upper respiratory uh, virus or whatever it is that we've all had, it <laughs> seems. And then uh, remember Larry. Uh, he's still in bed battling um, an upper respiratory infection uh, as well as the cancer. But th we got good news this week. They did a brain scan and the cancer has not gone into the brain. And so it's localized still where they think it is in the esophagus. And so um, the prognosis is good. We just got to get him fattened up a bit so that they can go in and get that mess out of there. Uh, but there is so much uh, sickness going around. So be uh, mindful to pray for your brothers and sisters. Uh, as you may have uh, surmised by this point, the end of the world did not happen yesterday. <laughs> so the Mayans didn't know better. I was suspect about the Mayans when they couldn't invent the wheel. I figured if you couldn't figure out how to make round wheels to put on your carts instead of sleds in the middle of the jungle, that doesn't mean seem very good. I just didn't have a lot of confidence in them being able to prognosticate. Plus, given the fact that they couldn't foretell that the Spanish were going to come in and massacre them, uh, I figured they didn't know what they were talking about in the prognostication department. So I was right, and they were wrong. So, greater is he that lives within each and every one of us than the Mayan winged serpent god. It sounds comical, but ladies and gentlemen, there are other people following other religions with equally as strange gods, as equally as silly prophecies. And they will all be shown to be false. Yesterday I had someone in my office that came from Sri Lanka. And he asked me a question. He says, why do I need religion when more people have been killed in the name of religion than for any other thing? And I said, that's a good question. And that is true. When your religion is violent. And nearly all religions are violent. We can look at the history of Muhammad. We don't have to surmise. Is m m Islam a religion of peace? We don't, we don't have to guess. It's not room for interpretation. We know that Muhammad historically converted by the sword. We know it. It's not up for discussion. It's historical fact. They admit it. The Equally as violent were the so-called enlightened Buddhists that forcefully converted those in Indochina. Same thing with the Hindus and the Sikhs, even the Christians with their crusades, killing thousands and if not millions of Jews and Arabs and equally causing their own to be massacred. There's only one religion that has not forcibly tried to convert but allows it to be a freedom of choice and that's the faith of Yahweh. And we don't forcibly convert. We, we don't even aggressively convert. What we're called to do, arise, shine. For the glory is on you. Be a light to the Gentiles. We just be. We're that lighthouse on that ragged seashore that says, be careful. 
the storm is raging and the shoreline is cruel. We're that light that says, here is warmth, food, and shelter from a sin-sick world. Come to the light. That's, that's deep. As you can imagine, this is the second week I've mentioned this person. Businessman here in town. Well, how come you haven't reeled him in yet? I'm giving a little play and a little slack in the line so that I don't pull the hook out of his jaw. I'm reeling him in. Why am I mentioning this? Because I want you just to be. People are watching your epistles known and read among men. People are watching you. How are you living? How are you living? Arise and shine. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts, like you, have good understanding. And to you belongs Yahweh, and to him belongs eternal praise. Praise Yahweh, my soul. Yahweh, my Elohim. You're very great. You're clothed with splendor and majesty. Yahweh wraps himself in light as with a garment, and he stretches out the heavens like a tent. Gentlemen, would you please stand, and ladies, would you hold on to your seat seats as we put on our garments of praise, our garments of salvation, because when we do so, we're coming into our own tabernacle of praise. Baruch atah Yahweh, Elecheinu melech haolam, Asher kadashanu b'mitzvotav, Vitzivanu al mitzvot, Zit zit. Amen. Which means, blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us concerning the doctrine of seed seed. And here is this doctrine. Throughout the generations to come, you were to make tassels on the corner of your garments with a cord of techelic, a unique kind of heavenly blue, on each tassel. You'll have these tassels to look at, and so you'll remember all the commands of Yahweh, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. Then you'll remember to obey all my commands and will be consecrated to your Elohim. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher kadashanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lahitatev b'atzitzit. Amen. Which means, blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to enwrap ourselves with seat seat. Now, we're all snug in our own tabernacles of praise. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of Yahweh. Amen. You may be reseated. I will exalt you, Yahweh, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Yahweh, my Elohim, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Yahweh, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the abyss. Sing the praises of Yahweh, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor, uh, that lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last only for the night, but joy comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I, I said, I'll never be shaken. 
Yahweh, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. You, to you, Yahweh, I called. To Adonai, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced, I said. If I go down to the abyss, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear Yahweh and be merciful to me. Yahweh, help me. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Yahweh, my Elohim, I will praise you forever. Amen. Mato. Yako Mishkano Teha Israel How good me or thy tents. O Jacob, thy tabernacles, O Israel, but ni pero are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and the Israelites forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Let us stand and make our profession of faith as we face the holy city of Jerusalem. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Eloheinu, Oh, oh, oh. 
Yahweh is our Elohim. Yahweh is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. You shall love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. You shall fix them as a mezuzah on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remain standing as we pray the Netzarim Amidah, the standing prayer of the Nazarenes. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen you may be received. Baruch atah Yahweh elachinu melaka olam asher natan lenu et direk ha Yeshua ba Mashiach Yeshua, which means altogether, blessed are you Yahweh our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. Speedily cause the branch of David thy servant to sprout, and let his horn be exalted by thy salvation because daily do we wait for thy salvation. Altogether, I believe with perfect faith in the coming of the Messiah. Ever how long it takes, I will await his coming every single day. Barku et Yahweh Hamvarek. Bless Yahweh who is to be praised. Altogether, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath, throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so that you may know that I am Yahweh, who makes you holy. O Yahweh, among the Elohim, who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. Come, O God, believe Me, come, O God, Negebakode. No. Oh, say, 
like you among the Elohim Yahweh. There are no deeds like yours. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout the generations. Yahweh rules. Yahweh has ruled and Yahweh will rule forever and ever. Yahweh will give strength to his people and Yahweh will bless his people with wholeness or peace. Father of mercy, bestow your favor upon Sion. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, for in you alone we trust, Elohim and ruler, high and exalted, master of all the world. Kadosh, 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 Kadosh. Yahweh Elohim Sebao Yahweh Elohim Sebao
Kadosh Le'Yahweh Kadosh 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 Yahweh Elohim Zebaoh Hashem Yahweh, Baruch Hashem Yahweh, Amen, 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 Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Amen, 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 Amen. Yahweh, you are holy and your name is holy and the holy ones praise your name every single day forever. Blessed are you, the Holy One of Israel. When the ark would travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Yahweh, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Sion will go forth the Torah and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people Israel. For from Sion will go forth the Torah and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who gave the Torah to his people, the commonwealth of Israel. Come forth, Regina, daughter of the Torah. You may be receded. The Torah is at rest. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed. Blessed is Yahweh who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose us from among all people and gave us his Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. The Torah Parsha that I will be reading will be Numbers 32, 20 through 25. And Moses said to them, If you will do this thing, if you will go armed before Yahweh, and will go all to and go all of you armed over Jordan before Yahweh, until he has driven out his enemies before him. And the land be subdued before Yahweh, then afterwards you shall return, 
and be guiltless before Yahweh and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before Yahweh. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against Yahweh, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep, and do that which has proceeded out of your mouth. As the sons of God, the sons of Reuben, spoke to Moses, saying, Your servants will do Adonai commands. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and implanted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Come forward, Adele, you who consider the prophets. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who chose good prophets and was pleased with their words, which were spoken in truth. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chooses the Torah, Moses his servant, Israel his people, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Our reading today will be from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 17 through 21. Have you not done this to yourself, in that you have forsaken Yahweh, your Elohim, when he led you on the way? And now, what do you gain by going to Egypt, to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? Your own wickedness shall correct you, and your backsliding shall reprove you. Know therefore, and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that you have forsaken Yahweh, your Elohim, and that my fear is not in you, says Adonai, Yahweh of hosts. For long ago I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds, and you said, I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and every green tree you bowed down, playing the harlot. And I have planted you a noble vine, holy, a right seed. Now then, have you turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine to me? Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, rock of all the ages, righteous in all generations, the Almighty, the Faithful One, who says and does, who speaks and fulfills, for all his words are true and right, for the Torah, for the divine service, for the prophets, for this Sabbath day which you gave us, Yahweh our Elohim, for holiness, for rest, for honor, for glory, for all this, Yahweh our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed be your name by the mouth of all the living, continually forever. Blessed are you, Elohim, sanctifier of the Sabbath. Come forward, faithful disciple of Messiah Yeshua. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us his only begotten Son as our Redeemer, and has given a new covenant to the house of Israel, unifying the two into one new kingdom, the commonwealth of Israel. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who chose the original twelve apostles to bring this message of renewal to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and have chosen us to carry on this work to shift Israel from the nations where you scattered them. May this reading serve the hearts of your people. 
Nazarene scriptures will be from Acts chapter 6 from verse 8 through 15. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called of the Lib Libertines, Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and to them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit which, by which he spake. Then they instigated men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against Elohim. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witness which said, this man ceased not to speak blasphemous word against the holy place and the law. And we have heard him say that this Yeshua of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall ch change the customs which Moshe delivered us. And how that sat in the council looked steadfast on him, saw that his face as it had been the face of an angel. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, for ratifying the new covenant that gives to your people a law of return by the sacrificial blood of your son, King Messiah, Yeshua. We thank you for giving us this full messianic message of the kingdom. We proclaim to you all the world, the kingdom is at hand. For all this, Yahweh, our Elohim, we thank you and bless you. Blessed are you, Yahweh, who has renewed covenant with your people, Israel. Come forth, Gamaliel, and bring to Israel the song of truth. Blessed are you. Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who selected people of praise and was pleased with their worship in the spirit and truth. You raised up David, your faithful servant, and righteous anointed, the sons of Korah, who brought honor to their house, and righteous worshipers in every generation to sing songs of delight in your presence, and you inhabit their praise. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I will be reading Tehillim, it is better to take refuge in Yahweh, Tov Lachasot by Yahweh, than to put confidence in man, maybe Toach by Adam. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh, Tov Lachasot by Yahweh, than to put confidence in the princes, maybe Toach by Nedivim. All nations surround me, Kol Goyim Sevavuni. In the name of Yahweh, Bishim Yahweh, I will cut them off. Ki am, ki amilam. They surround me, Sabuni. Indeed, they surround me, Gam Sevavuni. But in the name of Yahweh, I will cut them down. Bishim Yahweh, Ki amilam. They surround me like bees, Sabuni Khidvrim. They are quenched like a fire of thorns. Duachu ke ish kutsim. For in the name of Yahweh, I will cut them off. Bishim Yahweh ki amilam. They pushed me hard that I might fall. Dahu ki dahutai lin pol. But Yahweh, help me. Yahweh azarani. The Yah is my strength and my song. Uzi vazimrati Yah. And he became my salvation. The Yihili li shu'a. Uzi vazimrati Yah. May it be your will, Yahweh our Elohim, and the Elohim of our ancestors, that you pay heed and mercy to the psalms that I have recited, and may it stand in love, fellowship, and companionship, for we love you and you alone. Amen.
This is the Torah which Moses placed before the children of Israel. Behold, a good doctrine has been given to you. My Torah do not forsake it. Altogether, all that Yahweh has said, we will do and hear. It is the tree of life for those who grasp it, and those who support it are blessed. Its ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all of its paths are peace. Help us to return to you, Yahweh, and then truly shall we return. Renew our days as in the ancient past. Amen. All righty. You may be reseated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my strength and my redeemer. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the study of your word. Amen. I have seen until I'm a bit nauseous. This on the marquee of most churches during this time. Celebrate the season, but don't forget the reason. I would say to them that while you're celebrating the season, you don't know the reason. So I would like to share with you a message entitled, the season of reason. The season of reason. The Sitra Hara, the dark forces, hate mankind. They hate you and your family. All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole of creation and placing Hasatan on the throne of Yahweh. Unless and until you're prepared to look at the whole truth, wherever it may go and whoever it may lead to. You want to look the other way or you want to play favorites. Then when you come to the judgment seat of heaven, you're going to find out you've been messing with divine justice. You cannot trust the shepherds. For the shepherds have been deceived and are deceiving Listen to what they say. We should always be prepared to, so as never to err to believe that what I see as black and white, if the hierarchic church defines it thus. In other words, if I see that it's black, but the church says it's white, I must say it's white. That's crazy. Ignatius said, do you see the advantage of deceit? For great is the value of deceit. Are you kidding me? I said, are you kidding me? This is crazy. So you can't trust the shepherds, for the shepherds are feeding the sheep poison grass. We've got to go all the way back to the original conspiracy. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact. Nimrod was the ringleader of the original apostasy. E.W. Bullinger in his companion Bible says, Nimrod shed innocent blood and rebelled against Yahweh Elohim. Nimrod was a murderer before Yahweh. Now in Genesis 10, 8 through 9, it says, Nimrod, he displayed himself a mighty hunter in opposition 
to Yahweh. Horatius Bonar, the great Scottish theologian, put it this way, and I quote, His name is Nimrod. It means the rebel. And he is evidently meant to designate the nature of the man. He was the first specimen of giant tyranny after the flood. His defiance of Yahweh was perpetrated in wi wickedness and ambition under the, eye, the very eyes of Yahweh. Nimrod's assumptions were religious as well as political. Nimrod presented himself not only for obedience but also for worship. His awful greatness was of ambitious rebellion, apostasy, and defiance of Yahweh. And as it was Babel that was the beginning of his empire, so is Babylon the Great, its con con consumption and close. End of quote. It's not on the white. Okay. Harry Lancaster in his book Narrow is the Way says this, and I quote, as the people increased in number, the way of Yahweh was corrupted, and a principal figure in those days was Nimrod, the grandson of Ham, described as a mighty hunter before Yahweh. The word before is used in this sense to mean totally antagonistic to Yahweh. We celebrate Christmas on the date which coincides with the birthday of Nimrod, the villainous king of ancient Babylon. End of quote. In Genesis 11, 1 and 2 says, Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They settled in that crescent valley where there are 28 different kinds of topsoil. As the earth is carried by the Tigris and the Euphrates and there nestled between those two rivers is Babylon the Great, the mother of all mysteries. They said to each other, these people, come let us make bricks. Now you may not see that as a big technological feat, but can you imagine here in this plain where there were no rocks to be had to build buildings, these people developed a technology to make artificial rocks, and since they were controlling the making of the rock, they could control the shape of the rock. Making it rectangular, they were able to pile them and build buildings that could reach the sky. Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower, a ziggurat that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Now, why is that important? Because mankind has just been judged by Yahweh. These people says, we need to make a name for ourselves so that Yahweh won't push us around. He'll understand we're technologically advanced. So we need to make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 3-4. And Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And Yahweh said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So Yahweh scattered them from there all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because Yahweh confused the languages of the whole world. From there, Yahweh scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 3 through 9. If you remember, when we signed the peace treaty to end secession in Iraq, where did the allies sign the treaty? At the base of this tower, this ziggurat in Ur. That same ziggurat that was built 21 
500 BCE is still standing there. In ruins, but there. In Iran, you see those ziggurats. These are smaller versions of what the people were building in Babel. For worship to Nimrod. The Shepherd of Hermes, a book written by Pope Clements, his brother, makes this admission. And as for the tower that thou seest built, it is myself, namely the church, which has appeared to thee both now and heretofore. In other words, the church that we're building is the similitude of that tower built by Nimrod and his people in Babel. The tower of Babel is really the church. This is the wrong religion. This is the religion of Babylon. Again, E.W. Bullinger in his companion Bible, Nimrod began to prevail in wickedness for he shed innocent blood and rebelled against Yahweh. So as you can see, Nimrod was the chief architect of the original apostasy. Nimrod centered his apostate religion on the sun, which was a natural thing to do. It's simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness, of the night. Without it, the sun, people could understand the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most revered physical object in man's limited existence. Nimrod began associating himself with that sun. Nimrod had a wife by the name of Samaramis. And as you can see from this relief, Samaramis was a beautiful woman. But she was very vile and evil-minded, just like her husband Nimrod. The influence of these two people, Nimrod and Samaramis, led many to turn away from the good example of Shem, the son of Noah, and thus many people fell into great apostasy. Putting it frankly, The religion of Nimrod was just sexier than the faith of Yahweh. They formed a holy trinity. Nimrod the father, Semiramis the mother, queen of heaven, and Tammuz the son. This was reinterpreted in Egypt as Horus, Osiris, and Isis. You say, I've heard that word Tammuz, the son of Nimrod and Samaramis. You should have because in Ezekiel it's mentioned as the apostasy that the children of Israel were getting into. The angel brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of Yahweh. The house of Yahweh. And I saw women sitting there mourning the God of Tammuz. He said to me, do you see this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things that they're doing in here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them, although they shout in my ears. I will not listen to them. Ezekiel 8, 14, 15, 17, and 18. In Israel, they've recently found this relief, and it's utterly disgusting. Written about 400 BCE. It's an Aramaic papyrus from the Jewish military colony, oh no, not in Israel, excuse me, in Heropolis, in Egypt, a Jewish colony. And it speaks of the temple to the Queen of Heaven in the 5th century BCE, in the days of Nehemiah and Ezra. We know from the Elephantine papyri that the Jews of Elephantine were still worshipping other gods and goddesses besides Yahweh 
including Asherah. That's the Semitic name for Samaramis. This is the sin of Jeroboam, mixing the pagan religion with the faith of Yahweh. And the inscription says, and I'm quoting, the utterance of Ashiah, the king, say to Yahalel and to Yaasa and to, I bless you by Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. Jeremiah says, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto me in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her as we have done we and our fathers and our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had we plenty of victuals and we were well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and poured out drink offerings unto her without our men? Seest thou not what they do in the street, cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle fires and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger, Yahweh says. Jeremiah 7, 17-18 and Jeremiah 44, 16-19. These pagan gods, where you call them Mithra, Zeus, Jupiter, Nimrod, it's all the same. Whether you call her Venus, Aphrodite, Ishtar, Samaramis, Asherah, it's the same apostasy and it's disgusting in the eyes of Yahweh. An ancient stele. Listen to what this says. I quote. Let them make their land shine. By building temples for themselves. As for us. By as many a name. As we have called. He shall be our God. Let the wise teach the mystery to the wise. In other words, whatever we call him doesn't matter. It's the same deity. It's Nimrod. And it's in opposition. This religion is in opposition to the faith of Yahweh. Quoting Ralph Woodrow's Babylon Mystery Religion. And I quote, Thus from Babylon emerged the entire complex of human religion, the various gods and goddesses of Rome, Greece, India, Egypt, and other nations can be identified with corresponding gods of Babel. David Terrell's book, World Religions, says this, and I quote, In his deified form, Nimrod, the sun god, is known as Baal, Mythology reveals the fact that the god Baal and the goddess of the queen of heaven were universally worshipped under various names and titles. History confirms that Nimrod and his wife Samaramis were the prototype for all gods and goddesses that permeated all subsequent cultures and societies. End of quote. And I guess the most celebrated book on this subject is by the Episcopalian minister, Reverend Alexander Hislop, in his book, The Two Babylons, which was a serial in the London Times, printed uh, throughout from Halloween until Easter. And I quote, Nimrod of ancient Babylon became both the husband and son of Samaramis and was worshipped as both God the Father and God the Incarnate Son. In the, in the Bible, Nimrod it was called Moloch in Assyria, and Nimrod was called Baal or Baal or Baalus, meaning Lord. End of quote. So, this mystery religion from Babylon 
doesn't get offended if you use the term God or whatever, unless, of course, you're using the term Yahweh. Now, that's offensive. <laughs> In fact, the Vatican put out in August the 16th, 2008, that you shall not use the name of Yahweh in their services at all. You shall call him God. But that goes against the commandment. You shall not cause the name of Yahweh, your Elohim, to be nothing, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless who causes his name to be nothing. Exodus 20 and 7. So this religion of Babylon this mystery religion is the same religion that we see in the Vatican. And it goes all the way back. Mary and her baby all the way back to Samaramis or Ishtar and Tammuz. The legend goes that Samaramis came down from heaven in a half shell and that later she gave birth to a baby that was found in the clam shell rolled up by the fish on the banks of the Tiber. Or Venus. Her half shell pu pushed up by the dolphins to Ephesus. It's all the same crazy story. The 25th of December was celebrated in ancient days as the birthday of the unconquerable sun. Virtually variously known as Tammuz, Mithras, Saturn, Adonis, and Baal. Christendom chose the date of September or the 25th of December to be the birth of Christ because it was already the popular birthday of all the sun gods around the world. In the book Man and His Gods, it says this, and I quote, The winter solstice, December the 25th, was the time at which all the sun gods from Osiris to Jupiter and Mithra had celebrated their birthdays, end of quote. We can't mention in the school the story of Yeshua and his birth. But this is a popular children's book in the school libraries. Ishtar and Tammuz, a Babylonian myth of the seasons. <laughs> the Akkadian goddess Ishtar, the Sumerian goddess Inanna, and also known as Astarte, Inuit, Atosamayan, and Esther, Easter, I should say. Samaramis or Ishtar, according to New Unger's Bible Dictionary, was the same deity as Artemis of the Ephesians. Not a Greek de deity, or divinity, but an Asiatic one. This is shown by the fact that eunuchs were employed to her worship, a practice quite foreign to Greek ideas. She was not regarded as a virgin, but as a mother and a foster mother, as is clearly shown by the multitude of breasts in the shrewd effigy. She's a, she was undoubtedly a representative of the same power presiding over conception and birth that was adorned in the Palestinian under the name of Ashereth. Her worship, frantic and fanatical, after the manner of Asia, was traced back to the Amazons. Her temple at Ephesus was one of wonders of the world, but, it is great, but its great glory was the image which fell down from heaven. Acts 19 and 35. Now what is this thing that fell from heaven? A meteor fell to the earth. It split in two before it did so. Part of it fell at Mecca. The other part fell at Ephesus. And this is the truth of the story. That something fell from the sky. Not an egg, but a meteorite. And it fell into the marsh at Ephesus. 
And so they built a temple over that place. And they said that was Venus coming down on her half shell. While in Mecca, they said, oh, that was Allah coming down. And so they venerate it to this very day. Artemis or Diana supposedly was the daughter of Zeus, the twin sister to Apollo, the sun god. Artemis is also the harbinger of doom and has been linked with wolves as she meets out her judgment with her arrows of destruction. Artemis is also gifted with bowmanship, a sen sensible skill for the goddess of the hunt. In Amazonian mythology, she detests male sexuality as a lesbian. But she initially started out as a mother goddess figure of an older pantheon known to be the goddess of the moon, childbirth, and female fertility. In the Etruscan mythology, she took the name of Artum, deer, and the evergreen cypress are sacred to her. Again, quoting Reverend Alexander Hislop, the two Babylons. And he frankly calls the cross the pagan symbol, the tov, the sign of the cross, the indisputable sign of Tammuz, the false messiah, the mystic tov of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians and the Egyptians, the true origin or the true original from the letter T, the initial of the name of Tammuz. The Babylonian cross was the recognized emblem of Tammuz, end of quote. So unbeknownst to most Christians that walk around with a T around their neck, this has nothing to do with the crucifixion. It has everything to do with Tammuz. You say, well, they don't know that. But Yahweh knows that. And don't you know it breaks his heart? In Egypt, Nimrod was known as Horus, the sun god of Egypt. He is the sun, anthropomorphized or personifi personified, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphs in Egypt, we know much about this reinterpretation of Nimrod. For instance, Horus being the sun or the light had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or night darkness versus light or good versus evil is the most basic of mythological dualities ever known and is still expressed on many levels to this day if you want a good story you have good versus evil every morning Horus would win the battle against Set while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld in the myth of Horus was born on the 25th of December of the virgin Isis Miri. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, which in turn three kings followed to locate and adorn the god-man. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus, Horus was murdered, his body scattered in pieces. When his mother and wife finds out, she gathers the scattered pieces and puts them in a box, buries them, and laments. Out of the ground springs up an evergreen tree, and thus Horus is resurrected. Isis Miri gives birth to Osiris the sun in the spring and she declares him to be Horus reincarnated and so the cycle begins all over again. And in fact, the mother is always seen as giving, been given power by the sun so she must be worshipped as in her idol form as the Madonna. So, on this, the solstice, the shortest day of the year. And in some horizons, the sun doesn't even come up. It, the sun is dead and is lamented or mourned. But then the day after the solstice, the sun is seen again on the horizon. And then the days get longer. From that point on, the days get longer and longer and longer until we get to the spring equinox with the rebirth And where is that sun going to poke up on the next day after the solstice? Right where the three kings, those three stars, point to. The oldest known 
iconography of the nativity scene has been discovered underneath the Vatican. Here we see the Madonna. And there is Baalim pointing to a star. There below it you see those three kings from Babylon coming to find the sun. Here Christ is seen as Apollo. And Apollo, the Christ, is seen as the good shepherd between the two trees, evergreen trees. Down here you see the halo of Halois, the sun god, and you see Christ as portrayed as Halois in Roman tunic in the subfloor of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Why? Because this used to be the place for the worship. A place for the mystery Babylon worship imported by the Roman soldiers to Rome. So as you see on that horizon all of these, the solstices, the equinoxes, all of these were being interpreted to the people as the story of Mystery Babylon. In the work called The Real Zeitgeist Challenge by Chris White, and I quote, Sun worship has been around for a long time. You have to understand those people took over Christianity 400 years after trying to completely destroy it. Rome all of a sudden had a change of heart and then became Christianity, or rather this monster that said it was Christianity. They chose a date for the birthday of Jesus, and the date they chose was because of its connection with the sun. They did other things too. This is also about the time you began to see depictions of Jesus with halos and other objects associated with sun worship. You have to understand this does not prove that Jesus was a sun god. It only goes to prove that Sun worshippers were paying artists to depict Jesus more to their liking. End of quote. <laughs> so as you see, all of these gods are the same deity, Nimrod. And all of these goddesses are the same deity, Samaramis or Ishtar. And I've got to be honest with you. According to the article, Did God Have a Wife? The Archaeology and Folklore Religion in Ancient Israel by William G. Deaver. Listen to what he says. Did some Israelites <coughs> believe Yahweh shared his throne with his consort or wife Asherah? Some of the most powerful evidence for this contention is in the Bible itself. The fact that the Bible condemns the cult of Asherah and other pagan, pagan deities demonstrates that such cults existed and were perceived as a threat to the Israelite monotheism of the faith of Yahweh. Based on the biblical text alone, we can conclude that many ancient Israelites, perhaps even the majority, worshipped Asherah or Astarte, the queen of heaven, and perhaps other female deities. Their sanctuaries, these little tiny shrines in the house, we're told we're on every hill and on every green tree. The phrase reoccurs numerous times in the kings and the prophets. Some of the clearest physical evidence for the existence of a cult of Asherah is the growing collection of small house shrines. The technical name is naos, a Greek word that means temple or inner sanctum. End of quote. Brother Robert, you remember as when we went to see the priest's house there were niches on the wall where these little houses would sit so when you see the Madonna of Samaramis and Ishtar or you see the mother and child worship in Mexico it's all the same Madonna and what's behind her head the sun disk the halo whether we're talking about the Egyptian goddess Isis and her son Horus or the Roman Catholic Mary and the God incarnate Jesus or the Babylonian Semiramis 
and Tammuz. It's all the same. Addis of Phrygia, born of Nana on the 25th of December. Krishna of India, born on the, as the eighth son of Devaki with the star Rahoni signaling his coming. Dionysus of Greece, born of Simile and Zeus on December the 25th. Mithra of Persia, born of a rock on December the 25th. And the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. Hindus borrowed their myth of Krishna from Christianity. The parallels come from the Bhagavad Purana, dated from the 7th to the 11th century CE, and the Harivamasa, dated from the 4th to 6th century CE. In other words, the similarities only appear in Hinduism 250 to 950 years after the Messianic scriptures were written. So the Hindus flat out copied the Yeshua story, not vice versa. According to Martin Palmer's book, The Jesus Sutras, and I quote, Christian missionaries reached India and China early between the 5th and 7th centuries. This explains how the Hindus were able to borrow from Christianity, end of quote. Andre Boulanger says, and I quote, the conception that God, Dionysus, dies and is resurrected in order to lead his faithful into eternal life is represented in in no Hellenistic mystery or religion. So they borrowed it from our faith. In the first apology by Justin Martyr, he says this, and I quote, These things were said both among the Greeks and among all nations where they, the demons, heard the prophets of Israel foretelling that Messiah would specially be believed in but that in hearing what was said by the prophets, they did not accurately understand it, but imitated what was said by our Messiah, like men who are in error, we will make plain. End of quote. So if this, the Madonna of Catholicism, is not an idol, they say, no, 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 they're just images. Well, then these things here, the pagan Madonnas of the Eastern religions, can't be called idols, but images. No, ladies and gentlemen, all of these are idols. Recently, this was seen in the USA Today. First Christmas held at Roman Limprakel, or the wolf shrine. A recently discovered pagan shrine dedicated to Rome's legendary founder, Romulus and his brother Remus, is being linked by some experts to the first celebration of Christmas held on the date that still marks the, this festive holiday. Last month, Italian archaeologists unveiled an underground grotto which they believe ancient Romans worshipped as the place where a wolf nursed the legendary twins of Rome. Now a top Italian scholar thinks a church built on the same site of the shrine was where Christmas, where Christians first, excuse me, where Christmas was first marked on December the 25th, making it a symbolic place and efforts to link pagan practices with Christianity. So, and next time somebody says, Merry Christmas to you, you say, oh, well, here's wishing you and yours a happy Saturnalia. Celebrate the season, but don't forget the reason indeed. The reason is sun god worship. Listen to what the Catholic Encyclopedia says. The date of Christ's birth is not known. The Gospels indicate neither the day nor the month. According to the hypothesis suggested by H. Osner and accepted by most scholars today, the birth of Christ was assigned the date of the winter solstice, December the 25th, in the Julian calendar, January the 6th in the Egyptian, because on this day, As the sun begins to return to the northern skies, the pagan devotees of Mithra celebrated the 
Dies Natalis Solus, the Invicte, the birthday of the Invincible Son, on December the 25th. Aurelius had proclaimed the sun god principal patron of the empire and dedicated a temple to him in the campus Martius. In other words, the mountain or hill of Mars, Mars Hill, where the Vatican is. Christmas originated at a time when the cult of the sun was particularly strong in Rome. End of quote. The New Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 3, page 656. They admit these things. They admit that Constantine took all of the religions of his realm and ran them through a grinder to, to come up with the multi-headed beast called Mystery Babylon. Constantine's Christ was really Apollo or Apollyon. You see this in his coinage that gives homage to the invincible sun. You can see that in his halo, the beams coming off, and then we see the Christ underneath him. Same thing. You see this in the baby Jesus in the manger with his beams coming off of him. Merry Christmas indeed. Who is this Apollyon? Listen to this. When the abyss was opened, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. The angel of the abyss, his name in Hebrew is Avadon, but in Greek it is Apollyon, the destroyer. Revelations 9, 2 and 11. Proverbs 15, 11 says, Hell and Avadon are before Yahweh. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? The church originally taught that Apollyon was none other, was just another name for the resurrected and enthroned Jesus Christos, who is the personification of Jehovah, the destroyer. How do you get that? Well, when you look at the name Jehovah, it's a compound of two words. Yeho and Hova. Yeho, as first shows in his commentary of the Hebrew language, is the same as the Greek supreme deity, Io, who is the supreme deity over Zeus that no, the common people didn't even know about, only the initiates did. The Chaldeans had a Yeho as the supreme deity over Nimrod. The true key of this mystery deity was communicated to the initiates of the Babylonian mysteries only as Yeho, the triadral or trinity, as explained by the Hierophants. The Phoenicians had a supreme deity whose name was Yeho. He too was a trinity and a secret. Yeho was the sacred name in the Egyptian mysteries, which signifies the one eternal and concealed deity. And to this they added Hova, which means ruin and disaster, from the root word Ava which means to do perversely. The J was added in the 14th century. So Jehovah then is the God of ruin and disaster or the destroyer. But Constantine wasn't the first to make a hybrid deity for the masses. No, that went to Ptolemy I, called the Soter, the Savior, in 367 BCE and reigning to 283 BCE. He was a Macedonian general under Alexander the Great who became the ruler of Egypt and took the title of Pharaoh even though he was a Greek. He decided to produce a religion that would be acceptable to both the local Egyptian population and the recent influx of Greek immigrants and visitors. The Greeks would not accept an animal-headed deity and the Egyptians did not want to be Hellenized. So Ptolemy introduced the cult of Serapis which was a hybrid of Osiris and Apis with the appearance of Pluto. As the official cult of his new state, Ptolemy hoped a common religious base would unify the two peoples and ease tensions within the Ptolemaic kingdom. One thing is clear, this composite god Serapis became the true symbol of the new religiosity and the changed outlook of the new Greeks in Egypt. 
Serapis. The fusion of Osiris and Apis was a Greek or a Greco-Egyptian god. He was invented during the 3rd century BCE at the orders of Ptolemy. Now there was a letter that's been produced and we've seen. And listen to this. In the city on the borders of Egypt, which boast Alexander of Macedonia as its founder, Serapis and Isis were worshipped with reverence that is almost fanatical. Evidence that the sun under the name of Serapis is the object of all this reverence is either the basket set on his head of the god or the figure of the three-headed creature placed by the statue. The middle head of this figure, which is also the largest, represents a lion's. On the right, a dog raises its head with the gentle and fawning air. And on the left, the neck ends in the head of a ravening wolf. All three beasts are joined together by the coils of a serpent whose head returns to the god's right hand, which keeps the monster in check. Says Microbius in his work, the Saturnalia. Hadrian writes to Servanus in 134 CE and says this, and I quote, The land of Egypt, which you commenced to me, my dearest Servanus, I have found to be wholly fickle and inconsistent and blown about by every wind of rumor. The worshippers of Serapis here are called Christians, and those who are devoted to the god Serapis, I find, call themselves bishops of Christ. There is no chief of the synagogue a Jewish synagogue, or no Samaritan, no Christian presbyter who is not an astrologer, a soothsayer, or a Christian. Even the patriarch himself, when he comes to Egypt, is forced by some to worship Serapis and by others to worship Christ. End of quote. Hadrian to Servanus. According to Plutarch, Ptolemy stole the colossal cult statue of Pluto from Sinope, having been instructed in a dream by the unknown god to bring the statue to Alexandria where the statue was pronounced to be Serapis by two religious experts. One of the experts was of the Eumolopidae, the ancient family from whose members the Hierophants of the Eleusian Mysteries had been chosen since before history. And the other was the scholarly Egyptian priest Menentho, who gave the world the story of Atlantis, by the way, which gave weight to the judgment both for the Egyptian and the Greeks. Opiscus said, and I quote, Those who worship Serapis are Christians. They are a turbulent, inflated, lawless body of men. Is it not possible that the reverence to Christ and the Christians has been too hastily applied to the followers of Messiah? The Christians who were detested by the people for their crimes are not followers of Yeshua at all, but followers of Crestus, the scum of Egypt, the Apaches of Rome, the a people on whom Nero could very easily cast the suspicion of having set fire to Rome. In fact, some followers of Serapis were eventually expelled from Rome when in 19 CE, in 68 CE, a mob of pagans is said to have formed at the Serapis Temple in Alexandria, who then descended on the Nazarene believers who were celebrating Passover. And there they seized Johannan Marcus, dragging him through the street before throwing him into prison. Clearly, those worshippers of Serapis and Yeshua were aware of each other and the differences within their religions. So Constantine's official new Roman god was part Zeus, part Serapis, to get Jesus Christos, the Jesus Christ. So, the baby Jesus surrounded by his mother with the sun beaming from both their heads. Notice the holly on the manger. The holly god Saturn, his birthday was also December the 25th. Notice above the head of the baby Jesus is the T, the sacred symbol of Tammuz, god of Babylon who was also born on the 25th of December. Or you see the baby rising on the horizon as the sun. The 
the entire earth is lying in the power of ancient Babylon and the spell cast by Nimrod and Samaramis. Nimrod and Samaramis giving birth to Tammuz. Look at this idol here. That's not a Christian icon, but a Babylonian icon. That's the Christian icon there. Look at the similarities. So the sacred trinity of Babylon, Nimrod, Samaramis, and Tammuz. all belong to Mystery Babylon. But being the whore of Babylon was considered a secret wisdom in the book called Theosophia of the Gnostics found at Nag Hammadi. Listen to this. I am the horned one, the scorned one. I am the whore and the holy one. I am she whose wedding is great and I have not taken a husband. I, I am a goddess. Or I am godless, and I am the one whose God is great. I am the one below, and they come up to me. I am sinless, and yet the root of sin derives from me. For I am the wisdom of the Greeks, I am the Sophia, and I am the knowledge of the barbarians, the Freya. I am the one whose image is great in Egypt. I'm Isis. Do you know what? Constantine named the first church Thea Sophia. <laughs> Constantine named the first church the Thea Sophia after the whore of Babylon. In Revelation 17 says this I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of the names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. In other words, from her came every other form of apostasy. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Yeshua. What other group has ever killed more of Yahweh's people. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. The angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sits. There is no other city in the world but Rome called the city of seven mountains or seven hills. Revelation 17, 1 through 7 and 9. This mystery, Babylon, this church. According to Malachi Martin, a Jesuit priest and a member of the College of Cardinals, he wrote in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Church. By the 7th century, every known blood relation of Christ had been exterminated. Remember, she was drunk on the blood of the martyrs of Messiah. So Mystery Babylon brought the genocide of Messiah's own family, own flesh and blood family. So I've told you what the lie is. I would be remiss if I didn't tell you the truth. Therefore the sovereign himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14, which is translated, L is with us, quoted in Matthew 1, 23. Emmanuel, a compound word from a mom, meaning together, and L, the mighty one of Yahweh, meaning that L, or Yahweh, is gathered with us. He is the express image, the Adam Kedmona, the invisible Elohim, the Ain Sof, the firstborn of all creation, in other words, the son of Yahweh. For through him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the assembly, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead. That is, in all things he may have preeminence. 
Colossians 1, 15 through 18. We're told in Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 17 and Leviticus 23, celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Yahweh didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 and 17. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor Mighty L. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and justice for all that time forward, even forever. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will perform this. Isaiah 9, 5-7. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. What word? The Son. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. John 1, 14. Only in the warm weather do shepherds keep their flocks outdoors at night in Bethlehem. Now, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia said, there is no certainty as to the month or day of the birth of Yeshua, the Christmas date, December the 25th, was borrowed from the pagan festival. December seems unlikely as unsuitable for the pasturing of flocks. A more probable date is a couple of months earlier. In Sarah Ruins, uh, the chief Israeli weather service says this, and I quote, The temperature in the area of Bethlehem in December averages around 44 degrees Fahrenheit, but can drop to well below freezing, especially at night. That area was three months of frost, December with 29 degrees Fahrenheit. So it wasn't then. When was it? The Feast of Tabernacles. So it was that while he was serving as high priest before Elohim in the order of his divisions, talking about Zechariah, Zechariah, we see that his, the conception of his son was at the third of Savan. And then he was born on the 15th of Nisan. Yeshua was conceived on the 25th of Kislev and born on the Feast of Tabernacles. So, starting at Hanukkah, which begins on Kislev 25, and continuing for eight days and counting through the nine months of Miriam's pregnancy, brings one to the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And Elohim said, Let there be lights in the firmament, and they will be signs for you. Genesis 1.14 now a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head, a garland of twelve stars, then being with a child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Revelations 12, 1 through 2. So this sign was seen in the heavens. This was what the wise men were following. So we come out of Babylon and we believe what the scripture says. Come out of her, my people, and don't touch the filthy things. That's my message. You say, well, that gets so uncomfortable, Rabbi. Sure it does. You know why? Because the pagan goes to your marrow of your bones. Your people, my people, we believed this, didn't we? You see, a myth is an idea that, while wildly believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in a religious sense, a myth serves as a, an orienting and mobilizing story for the people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it's believed to be true in the community or the nation not a matter of debate that some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth against the sacred story. The keepers of the faith won't enter into a debate with it. They just ignore people or call them blasphemers. So what do we do? We be. We just be. And because we stand firm and we let the light shine in us, People notice. And they're attracted to our light. When people say, 
well, you don't keep Christmas, do you? No. What do you do? Hanukkah. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, I thought you believed that. I thought you believed in the Lord. I believe in Yeshua that you know is Jesus. And it was distinctly on this time of Hanukkah, the festival of lights, that he said, I'm the light to the world. And then he commanded us to be lights to the world. Wow. Huh. Anyways, you only got one day. <laughs> we got eight days. Wow. Yeah. So you, you're just barely getting started celebrating, and then you got to stop. Not me. I got over a week to celebrate. Woohoo! So who's the party animal? <laughs> so Brother Robert's going to give you the printed lesson. But let me tell you, folks, there's a lot more information in here than I had a chance to tell you. So please study. Because people are going to ask you, why is your light so bright? Now, they won't say it that way. They'll say, why are you different? Then you say, well, let me tell you. They just might be Israel and come to the message. The gentleman I was talking to yesterday, I ended my discussion with him saying, by the end of days, all the families of the earth would have Israel mixed in them. And then they always said, I'll whistle for them. <whistles> and those that belong to him will come to that whistle. Because we're his pets. Now what he said, you'll be for me a treasured thing. Yes. And if you return to me, he says in Deuteronomy 30, I'll restore your inheritance and I'll love you. That's everything. So, let them celebrate their season. Even if they don't know the reason. We celebrate what we do know. What did Yeshua say? You worship what you don't want know. We, we worship what we do know. And that's why we keep what we keep. As a matter of faith. Let's all stand. I don't know about you, but I always like to, to back the winning team. We're on the winning side, ladies and gentlemen. This thing's going to wrap up soon. I think we're in the fourth quarter. And we're winning. And they've run out of timeouts. <laughs> I mean, how many of you are hungry? Well, good, I am too. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei mine mazahano. Baruch atah Yahweh, melech... <laughs> Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri ha'adama. Baruch atah Yahweh, Eloheinu melech haolam, sher hakol niye bidvaro. It's really difficult to read when the word gets right into the bifocal line. <laughs> Which means, blessed are you Yahweh our Elohim, king of the universe, who creates various kinds of sustenance, creator of the fruit of the earth, by whose word all things came to be. The humble will eat and be satisfied. And those who seek Yahweh will praise his name. May your hearts live forever. May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable to Yahweh. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless Yahweh your Elohim for the good land that he's given you. Let's eat. Amen. <laughs>